to remain standing as we read together from Psalm 137. Psalm 137, we're going to read together all nine verses. You see the words there for you on the screen. Let's read together. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundations, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed. Happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. We'll ask the Lord to add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. That psalm ends on a particularly odd note. It will be really good when people come and destroy you. You see, the psalmist is not asking for their enemies to be destroyed. They're asking for God's enemies to be destroyed. And that is the, the key. It's not where we want bad things to happen to other people, but we want God's enemies to be dealt with accordingly. This morning, we have the opportunity to learn a new song. Aren't you excited? We're going to, we're going to learn a new song, uh, a song that has, has meant a lot to me over the past several months, and it was already on the schedule. We were supposed to sing it as a special number last Sunday, but I was not here. But we're going to sing it together this morning. Um, the, the, the vocalists are going to sing along as we go through the first verse and chorus to teach, to teach you the, the, the tune and the words, and then we'll sing together through the, the verses that are there. Uh, the song is called, He Will Hold Me Fast.
This morning, as we go to prayer, let's remember to be praying for one another. Um, let's be praying for our brother, Mike, who is not here this morning, having some health issues uh, that are not serious, but are still not allowing him to be with us this morning. So be praying for Mike as he's having some medical issues there. Continue to pray for others who are hurting, who are ill, who are sick. Uh, be praying especially for our, our sister Becky down in South America. Uh, she has, if you've not been made aware, she has contracted COVID. Uh, her, her oxygen levels have been uh, dangerously low over the past week, but they are slowly making their way uh, back to a, a more healthy and sustainable range. Uh, she is doing much, much better than she was last week at this time. But there's still a long way to go. There are still, uh, recoveries to be made. There's still treatments to be, to be given. Uh, continue to pray there. Uh, we are working to set up a, a means of providing financially uh, for Bob and for Becky uh, for their medical expenses. The healthcare system in Peru is much different than it is here. Uh, here, if you have a serious issue, you go to the hospital and doctors take care of you. In Peru, if you go to the hospital, they give you a bed and then they tell you, here's what you need. You have to go out and get it, bring it back, and then the doctor will do whatever the procedure is. There's not a drawer full of medicines or medical supplies. You have to go get them, bring them back, and then they'll do the procedure. Uh, so uh, be praying as, as uh, Bob is caring for Becky at home, since it is easier to do those, those things there. There have not been any procedures that are outside of his scope of, of performance. And so he's been able to care for her and get, giving her the best care possible uh, because it is absolutely 100% personal, personalized care. Uh, so be praying for them as they, they are uh, working on her recovery. Uh, Becky's sister, who is also a, a missionary in the same country, uh, is there with them, uh, helping care for Becky, helping care for Colton, uh, helping keep Bob where he needs to be uh, mentally and physically, and uh, be, be praying for, for them as they work on recovery. Uh, continue to pray. Um, I won't say continue to pray, but do be praying. Uh, Jean made me aware this morning. Jean, where did you go? Jean must be, oh, you changed sides of the church and now you're in camouflage. Okay. I looked right over here because that's where Jean is and he must have got tired of me preaching right at him and, and moved. Uh, remind me that last name again, Jean. Norid. Uh, Pastor Ron Norid. Uh, former pastor down at Mission Way Baptist Church in Union City passed away uh, this week after a lengthy illness, but uh, be praying for his family. Wife's name is Brenda. Okay, so be praying for the Nord family as they are, are definitely grieving the loss of their family member. Uh, do also be praying uh, for Kristen, uh, that is uh, my daughter-in-law. Uh, her grandfather is not doing well, uh, has uh, COVID and pneumonia, and is not doing well, is not uh, expected to, to live very long. Uh, so be praying for him. That would be uh, her grandfather, the last name there is Holt. And so be praying for Grandpa Holt. Uh, that would be Andrew's mother-in-law's father. Clear as, clear as day, right? Uh, Kristen's Grandpa Holt. Uh, be praying for, uh, for his health, be praying for his strength, be praying for his family as they go through this time uh, together as well. This is the first time I've seen you all in a while. Thank you for being you. You're the best you that anyone could ask for. And as a church family, you have shown our family such love and support and encouragement. It is wonderful. It is sustaining. It is gracious. It is exactly what is needed for each moment. Uh, we, we hardly would know what to do without you folks. Uh, it, the, the burden is much lighter knowing that we're not carrying it alone. The path is dark, but it's not as dark because you walk with us.
I get emotional. You are not surprised by that. It's not because of sorrow. It's an overwhelming sense of love and appreciation and care that you are showing that causes my eyes to fill up, my voice to catch, and uh, my, my words to quaver. Yes, I miss my dad, but I've not lost him. I know exactly where he is. And as we go to prayer this morning, we're confident that the same God that hears us, knows us, and loves us, and will sustain us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for who you are. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father that you have provided every good thing for us, that every gift from you is good and comes from the Father of lights. In you, there is no changing, no, no shadow, no turning. We thank you for that. We thank you for your steadfast love, your mercy, not giving us what we deserved. But in grace, you gave us what we could not earn. And we've just sung that you are the one who holds us fast. We thank you. We praise you this morning for the way that you have provided for us, for the way that you have demonstrated your ability to do above and beyond all we could ask or think or imagine. You've provided safety. You've provided help. You've provided direction. You've provided comfort. We thank you that you are a just God. That you're not one who can be bribed or have your will bent to ours but that you are holy and beautiful and just. We thank you that in your Son, Jesus Christ, your justice has been satisfied, your wrath has been, appealed, uh, has been appeased, and our guilt has been repealed. It's been paid for. And this morning we enter your presence as redeemed people. Not by our own actions, not by our own determination, but by your great work. Father, we are also needy people. You have satisfied us and provided for us, and yet there are still needs where we must see you work. There's a family who's grieving the loss of their father and grandfather and spouse. There's a church who's grieving the loss of a former pastor. We pray for Brenda and her family that you would provide comfort for the Nords in ways that they have not experienced in quite some time, but that reminds them of your amazing presence to comfort and guide during dark days. Pray for the Holt family, for the Lowry family, as they endure their loved one drawing close to eternity as they begin to walk through the valley of death's shadow. We thank you that it's only a shadow. You have dealt with the reality. 
And we thank you that they walk through. You've not led them to this place to abandon them. We thank you for the way that you're providing for Becky and her health and her strength. We thank you for providing for Pam and for Jeanette and for others as they have recovered. We thank you for providing for River as he endures such serious health issues at such an early age. Father, as we look around, there are many things that concern us, but our hope is in you. Our trust is in you. Our strength and our supply is found in you. And so to you, we bring our requests. To you, we give praise. And to you, we look for direction. Quiet our hearts in these moments, we pray, so that as we hear from you, your Holy Spirit, who speaks in that still, small voice, that that voice would echo large in our minds and in our lives. We pray for our dear brother Mike this morning that you would put your healing hand on him, that you'd continue to meet his physical needs, especially those that are separating him from us this morning. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. You're looking at a weak man. I got weak knees, weak eyes, and some even say I got a weak brain. But Our Bible reading this morning is from the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Philippians, chapter 4. I'll be reading the entire chapter. Therefore, my brothers and sisters... Whom you, who, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. <coughs> I plead with Iodia and I plead with Sinchi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, 
Not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering and an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. There was a stray hair on the inside of my mask, just tickling my throat. <coughs> wow. Little things can have big results. Today, we're going to discuss one of the most misunderstood, misapplied verses in the New Testament. A verse that's been twisted, stretched, and tortured by well-meaning individuals, but even injuries caused in ignorance still hurt. When we correctly understand and accurately apply the teaching of God's Word, we can more accurately practice its teaching. When you come to verse 13 in Philippians chapter 4, we're all used to hearing, seeing, reading, having it put on bumper stickers and phone cases and refrigerator magnets. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is Paul making a statement? Is he stating a promise? How should that verse, how should that sentence affect the Philippians? How does what Paul wrote in that verse affect me today? And while verse 13 can be lived out in many, many various ways, it conveys one singular truth. It can be applied in many ways and lived out in various ways applications, but it only means one thing. And what Paul is teaching us is this, Jesus knows my need. We've been looking at the book of Philippians and basing our study of it around the concept that Jesus is enough, that Jesus satisfies and as we come to this portion of Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14, we're going to find that Jesus is enough because Jesus knows my need. And because he knows my need, he can meet that need. He is enough. He satisfies. I'm going to share with you three areas of need. Three areas that you have this morning. Whether you're aware of it or not, you have a need for this. But here's the great thing. Whether you're aware of it or not, Jesus knows your need. And Jesus satisfies. The first is the need for joy. 
The need for joy. We find it in verse 10, where Paul says, I rejoiced. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. You did care, but you lacked opportunity. There's a need for joy. Paul had a need for joy. The Philippians had a need for joy. And Jesus knew their need. And he met that need. He used one another to meet that need in the other. Use the church to bring joy to Paul. Use Paul to bring joy to the church because Jesus knew their need. It was a need for provision. It was a tangible provision. Something that Paul could could put his hands on. Something that the Philippians had sent. We've read earlier in the book that they sent their dear, beloved Epaphroditus to bring this gift to Paul. He says it was tangible. It was real care. It was actual care. It wasn't, and I don't want to use this carefully, it wasn't what we see on social media today, the thoughts and prayers that just becomes a phrase, oh, our thoughts and prayers are with you. When you've said that, do you think of the person? Do you actually pray for the person? Or is it just something you type? Or worse yet, you see someone else has typed it and you just push like. Yeah, I'll do that too. This was real, actual care. Something that Epaphroditus had to carry with him. Something that Paul touched with his own hands. Something that ministered to him greatly. What they did was substantial. Both in its scope of what it was that was sent. And we don't know what it was and I'm glad. Otherwise people would be trying to duplicate it. But it was great and substantial in its effect. It blessed them to give. It blessed Epaphroditus to carry it. It blessed Paul to receive it. It was tangible. It was substantial. It brought joy. And it was timely. They wanted to do something. They just didn't have the opportunity to do it. Have you been there? I wish I knew what to do. I wish I could do something. I w- uh, what can I do? I, I, I just don't. Sometimes, you know, I, if I could only do this, if I could only get this to them. I, I experienced that several years ago. It wasn't the only time, but I remember it most clearly back in 2010 when I went and visited our missionaries in Chile and spent time getting to know them and minister among them and, and learn their names and see their faces and hear their voices to return and four days later have a tremendous earthquake strike the nation of Chile. The airport that I'd just come through sitting in shambles and sitting here saying, I I need to be there to encourage them, but no opportunity that you couldn't get the planes in. You couldn't get, couldn't get support to them in time in the way that I wanted to. That's what the Philippians were doing. Pierce Paul, we, we haven't heard from him in a while. We're not sure what's going on. We want to, to meet his need. We've already sent to him several times before. Paul mentions that in chapter 4. But now what are we going to do? There's, there's no one going that direction. Let's get something together. We'll send Epaphroditus, and they have to wait until everything lines up, and then we can send him. It's not that they lacked care. They just lacked opportunity. As they could, when it was possible, they acted right away. And Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9. He's writing to the Corinthians, and he's mentioning the Philippians. Paul tells the Corinthians, when I was present with you and in need. So here's Paul in Corinth, needing something. And the church in Corinth wasn't taking care of it. But he said, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And who were the people from Macedonia? They were Philippians. They came and they brought and they they met that need. As they had opportunity, they acted as the opportunity presented itself. And it causes joy. Now, Paul is not just giving joy or saying that, yes, I've got joy that's here because of, of your provision. He says there's also a performance that takes place there. There's a performance that takes place because of the opportunity that was made available. Now, in that opportunity, 
And you'll give, forgive me a moment while I get everything back where it needs to be. There we go. Paul was celebrating the joy that he had as he's talking about, oh, look what you sent me. He was celebrating the joy that was there. He was not trying to get them to send more. Oh, look how great that is. Wow, that would be, that's so great. If only someone would say, no, he wasn't giving some backhanded request for something else. He's celebrating the opportunity that they took to act out their Christian faith, to act out their Christian maturity, to act out what he had taught them to be looking out for the needs of others and to be meeting them. Paul is excited about what God was doing. And what was it that God was doing? He was moving Paul into a closer relationship with the church, the church into a closer relationship with Paul, and as a result, both Paul and the church are in a closer relationship with God. Look at what's happening here. I wasn't speaking in regard to need. He says, you, 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 you did this over and over, and now we've been brought closer together. God is doing something great here. So he's celebrating the opportunity that they took, but he's also celebrating how great it was of what they did because their gift met a real need. Paul definitely had a need. The Philippians met that need, and Paul says that was exactly what was needed. But relief of a need was not the goal that Paul was celebrating. Oh, wow. Look, we would say it today. Look, not, you, you were able to help me put new tires on my car. That's not what Paul was celebrating. He was celebrating the fact that God had done a work in them and they were being sensitive to what God was doing in their lives as they saw the needs of others in a way that allowed them to minister. And Paul says that is worth celebrating. Yeah, it may have resulted in new tires for a car, but look what God is doing. God's developing in you a sense of looking out for the needs of others and meeting those needs. That's something worth celebrating. So Paul says, I have joy, not because my need was met or not because you did it, but because God is working in you and that allows all the other things to take place. You see, Jesus knows your need for joy. And that joy doesn't come because you have everything that you want. It doesn't come because you necessarily have gotten something. But that joy comes as we see what God is doing in our lives and in the lives of others. That's the type of joy that he wants to give. That's the type of joy that he knows that we need as we see him at work in our life and in the lives of others. When is the last time that you rejoiced over how God is working in someone else's life? Whether or not that affects you. When was it? See, so often we get focused on me, 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 me. That we forget God is supposed to be doing something in my life and he's using others and look what God is doing in the life of others that causes growth to take place so that things are happening and God is doing something. Let's get excited about that. Let's be joyful about that. Notice what Paul's doing here in verse 10. And ask yourself a question, how could you encourage someone by mentioning what God is doing in your life without bragging? I, I don't hear Paul bragging in verse 10. Oh, God has met my needs, and look what I've got now. No, he says, God has done a great work. He's, he's working in other people's lives, and that's spilling over into my life. And it's, it's not about what I've gotten or what they've given, but it's what God is doing. How can you encourage others by talking about what God is doing in your life without bragging? Oh, well, well you know, I'm just bragging about God. 
be sure that you are. So often, when we're called to give a testimony, it turns into bragging about how great I am. And oh yeah, God was there too. How about we turn that around and talk about how great God is and oh yeah, I was there too. God knows your need for joy and he meets that need because Jesus is enough. But there's another need that's, that's met here in this passage and I want to show it to you. There are three verbs that we're looking at this morning. The first one is joy. I rejoiced in verse 10. The second verb is found in, in verses 11 and 12. It's the verb learned. And, you know, when you talk about learning, that calls up images of homework and school and formal education. But listen, God knows that you have a need not just for joy, but he knows that you have a need for training. You have a need for training. And Jesus cares so much that he gives you the joy that comes from seeing him at work, but he also gives you the training that you need. You notice in verses 11 and 12, whatever else Paul is saying, he says, I've learned. This is not something that, that uh, came naturally to him. Not something he was born with. Not something that just happened. It was something that was developed over time. It took some training. And this training was in the matter of contentment. I've learned to be content. And I really like the way that, that uh, Larry read it for us because that's exactly the, the, the thrust of, of the word that, that Paul uses. He talks about, I've learned the secret to being content. And in wonderful fashion, he doesn't keep the secret to himself. He tells us what the secret is. But Paul uses that word, he's learned the secret. You see, in Paul's day, there were many that said, if you're going to improve yourself as an individual, you have to learn these secret spiritual truths that are going to unlock all the mysteries of the world and the universe to you. Paul says, listen, I've learned the secret and I'll tell it to you. In fact, it's really not so much a secret because it's been written in God's word for quite some time. Look at Psalm 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. And he'll show them his covenant. He'll show them his promises. He'll show them who he is. Paul's learned the secret. What's the secret? Paul says, I've learned to always trust God. Well, how is that the secret? Because Jesus satisfies. Jesus cares. Jesus knows the need that we have. A need for joy, but also a need for training. Training in contentment. The secret, Paul says, is to always trust God. Because the world around Paul and around the Philippians and around that first century Greek and Roman culture said that contentment came when you could take care of yourself. When you had everything that you needed and you needed no one else to help you, that's when you can be content. And Paul says, let's look at that theologically, and he uses a great theological term to describe it, baloney. He says, it's not having everything that you need. It's finding that God has everything that you need and trusting him. That takes training. Because just as much as Paul's world and the Philippian culture and the Greeks and Romans tried to bake that into the thinking of their society, our society's done the same thing. Telling us you need to be self-reliant. You need to depend on yourself. You'll be content when you have everything that you need and you don't need anybody else. You can do it. I'm ashamed to say it, but it's often said, come on, you're an American, aren't you? 
as though that is going to give you some secret resource of contentment. Contentment is not found in having everything that I think I need. It doesn't come from where I was born or what citizenship I belong to. That contentment comes as I trust God who has everything that I need. And I rely on Him rather than myself. I rely on Him rather than my birth certificate. I rely on Him rather than my immigration card. I rely on Him rather than my passport. I rely on Him rather than my bank account. I rely on Him rather than my relationship with others. Paul says, I've learned the secret to be content is to trust God in everything. Because contentment comes from God, not from our resources. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, we read, Let your conduct, the, your way of life, be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I have lived long enough to tell you finances will leave you and forsake you. Vehicles will leave you and forsake you. Homes and property will leave you and forsake you. Relationships that you once counted on will leave you or, and forsake you. Jobs will be left. The things that you once counted on knowing that you had it all down, it will leave you. But let's be content because he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, that brings the training in contentment saying that this is the one thing that lasts and I can trust him. And once it's learned, it needs to be lived out. Paul says, every circumstance that I face, I face the same way. Trusting God who provides because Jesus satisfies. I can trust God because he's enough. Jesus is enough. And so I can face every situation the same way. Again, he tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. That's a lot of words. What Paul is saying is we don't have all the answers, but we know that God does, so we trust him in every situation whether those situations are feast or famine. Whether they're having plenty, and Paul had plenty. He was a prominent, popular Pharisee. He was on the fast track to having a place of prominence in the nation of Israel. He had a promising future. A future that he gave up a position that he gave up, a popularity that he gave up. But now he still had plenty. He had a peace that was centered on who God was despite his circumstances. There was feast and there was famine. Paul says, I know how to have a lot, but I also know what it means to be reduced, humiliated, destitute, Elsewhere, he tells us about facing hunger and thirst and fasting and nakedness and cold and torture and persecution. And he faced it the same way that he faced life when he had everything, trusting God, because contentment comes from God, not from the resources. Even though he was in want even though he lacked comfort, even though he lacked necessities, he trusted God. And God was training him to be content. See, Jesus knows your need. And there is a need for joy. There's also a need for training, and that training is in contentment. Something that has to be learned. Paul needed to learn the secret. It doesn't happen naturally. And it's not going to happen naturally for us either. Because I so often want to depend on my own resources, my own ingenuity, my own creativity, my own capacity. 
But that runs out. And that goes away. It disappears as soon as there's someone more clever, more creative, who has just a few more resources. See, contentment comes from God, not from my resources. Have you learned that? See, it's something that has to be learned, but it also has to be lived. So how are you demonstrating that God is enough, even when your circumstances seem to indicate that you need something, that you're not comfortable, your needs aren't being met, the difficulties are there. Can you say with Paul, I've learned the secret to trust God no matter what? See, Jesus knows that we have a a need for joy and a need for training. But now we come to verses 13 and 14. We find another verb. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in verse 14, nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. Jesus knows that we have a need for power. There's a need for ability. There's a need for strength. There's a need for power. But see, this power comes from one source and only one. It comes from Christ. Christ is the one who gives strength in every circumstance. Christ is the one who gives strength when we are full. He's the one who gives strength when we are in famine. He's the one who gives strength when we are abounding or being abased. He's the one who is giving us power when we have everything and when we have nothing. We come to verse 13, that most twisted verse. And with our 21st century American way of thinking, we think the emphasis there is, I can do all things. That's not the emphasis of the verse. If I would, re- I, I don't want to say that I have to rewrite Paul. But to communicate what Paul is saying is this, Christ makes all things possible. He's the one who gives strength in every circumstance. He's the one who gives strength. Paul's strength was not found in his body, was not found in the Philippians' gift, was not found in Epaphroditus' encouragement. It was found in Jesus. Because there's a connection there. Paul has already told us that he is in Christ. Look back at chapter 3, verse 9. Paul says, I want to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness that comes through faith in him. The righteousness which comes from God by faith. He says, that's where I am. I'm, I'm in him. He has me. I'm his. And now I can rest in who he is. I can rest in God's grace. Again, he tells the Corinthians about the troubles he was facing, and he begged God to take it out of his life. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul says, because of that, I will boast that I'm not powerful. I will boast that I am weak so that the power of Christ may be seen to be resting on me. Every circumstance is possible because Christ is the one who gives me strength. See, this verse is not about going out and doing anything we want to do. As though we were the hero of the story. This verse tells us that we can face everything that comes our way because Christ is the one who gives us strength. He's the one who holds us fast. It's a powerful source, and it brings success. 
Look at the success that it brings. It brings strength. I can face every circumstance because Christ is strengthening me. And you've done well because you were sharing. What, what Paul says is when he says they've done well, he's describing, it describes an act of nobility, an act of courage, an act that is worthy to be celebrated. It's the same term that Jesus uses when the woman comes and anoints his feet with oil. And everybody says, oh, what's she doing that for? Why? Oh, my, my goodness, that's a waste of money. And Jesus says in Mark chapter 14, verse 6, leave her alone. Why are you troubling her? She's done a good work for me. This is something that should be done, something that must be done, something that needed to be done. She was the only one who saw that it, that it could be done, and she was willing to do it. That's what Paul says you've done. Something that only you could do, and you did it because only you could do it, and God's going to reward you for it. Their action was real physical help to Paul. But it was also emotional help. Paul, you're not alone. It was mental help. Paul, you're in our thoughts. It was spiritual help. Paul, remember, God will meet your needs, and he's, he's met our needs so that we have an ability to share with you. It's more than just, uh, here, here's, here's, here's a tchotchke. Here's a magnet to put on the bars of your cell. No, they shared in his distress. They took action in a way that demonstrated their companionship and fellowship together. In a way that demonstrated, Paul, we're in this together. When it hurts you, it hurts us. When you celebrate, we celebrate. When you have a need, we want to meet it. When you, when you have plenty, we want to rejoice with you. They were shareholders in his ministry, responding to his real needs. And Paul says that's where the success is, realizing that it's not any one of us, but that together God is doing something with us. Jesus knows your need for power. But rather than just giving you power, he gives you himself. I can do all things through Christ strengthening me. Those who've experienced God's sustaining power will want to share it with others. Who do you know? Who do you know that needs to experience God's power in their life? How can you share the fact that Jesus is enough and he's done so much in me and he wants to be a blessing to you as well? How can you encourage and strengthen others in a way that indicates God is the source of power rather than, oh, well, I'm the one who's helping you. The problem, the difficulty there is soon people start thinking we're the answer to the problem. No, it's God. All throughout this, Paul is not saying, Philippians, you were the answer to my problem. No, God was the answer. He used you, but God was the answer. God is the one who strengthened me. You did a great work, but God is the one who's been doing it. When we realize that Jesus is enough, that he satisfies our need for joy, our need for training, our need for power. We can rest in him. We can say with Paul, I've learned wherever I am to be content. To say, it is well with my soul. The storms may rage, but the master is here. It's not about the storm going away. It's about me having peace in the midst of the storm. Because Jesus is enough. He knows my need for joy. He knows my need for training. He knows my need for power. Is he enough for you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are enough and we hear it and we watch it being lived out in others' lives and 
there are moments when we wonder, could I ever experience that? Father, the answer is yes for those who are rightly related to you. Perhaps there's one today who needs that relationship with you that that trusts in you and sees you as the fulfillment of those needs. Needs to trust you for the salvation and deliverance of their soul. May today be the day that they turn from you or turn to you from themselves. That they turn from trusting themselves or what they've done or what they've thought or what they've imagined to what you have said to be true. Knowing that you are enough. Father, we who have a relationship with you based on our ongoing trust of your son as our deliverer, our savior, we too have need for joy. We too have need for training and contentment. We too have need to see your power displayed. Those constant reminders that we are not enough, but that you are always ever enough. We thank you that you know our need. We ask that you would teach us what it means to trust you in every circumstance that we would experience that joy and power that comes from knowing you and resting in you, that no matter what your hand may bring us in life, we can say from a taught heart that it is well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning... We're going to sing as our closing hymn, hymn number 705. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Let's stand together as we respond. While others are singing, if you need to respond to what God has been speaking to you about, do so. If I can be of help, come to the front. I'd be glad to speak with you, all right?
We trust that it is well with your soul. Thank you, those of you who are joining us online. We look forward to seeing you tonight at 8 o'clock for our Front Porch Fellowship. We'll say goodbye to you for now.